It's one thing to blow up a spaceship. It's another to dismantle it piece by piece, systematically reducing it from a hulking barge to a pile of valuable scrap. There's a great sense of satisfaction in doing that job well, especially when performing it efficiently requires careful planning and carries a not insignificant risk of killing yourself in a wide variety of ways in the process. Hard Space Shipbreaker does a fine job of empowering us to carve out these giant space turkeys like every day is Thanksgiving, and smothers it in a thick blue collar gravy, but it does wear thin with time. By the end of its campaign, the repetitive objectives and intentionally slow progression made shipbreaking start to feel like exactly what it's simulating, hard labor. Almost immediately, floating in space to that twangy music took me back to an early scene from the pilot episode of 2002's Firefly, where the crew raids a derelict ship for valuables by cutting through the hull and floating away with them. Swimming through a shipyard with a full six degrees of freedom feels serene, and it's easy to maintain control thanks in part to the brake button that brings you to a full stop. And sure, the graphics and lighting aren't cutting edge by any means, but the spaceship designs are distinctive, asymmetrical, and interesting. The plot isn't at all subtle about its comical corporate dystopia where workers are kept in indentured servitude to a tyrannical interstellar business empire that exploits them relentlessly. It even resurrects them after fatal accidents so they can continue to work off their crushing debt. The story that plays out over unskippable audio is equally one note. Gotta do it all over again tomorrow. With your character's crew of salvagers basically being forced to unionize to fight back against their corporate overlords. There's not much by way of memorable moments or surprises, and the supervisor villain is a standard issue middle management caricature. I know you don't love a middle manager like me coming in, making life hard. Really, it's all about the work, and dismantling a large spaceship is definitely a rewarding exercise. It boils down to zapping yellow bits that join hull plates together with your cutting laser, then using your handheld tractor beam and deployable tethers to toss chunks of scrap and machinery into whichever of the red, blue, or green ports on the surrounding space station you're told to. Most of the cutting has a paint-by-numbers feel to it because only those cut points can be disintegrated, but certain materials can be cleaved away with this cool laser. Though sometimes it's annoyingly hard to cut away that last little bit. There are quite a few dangers in play. Upon approaching a new ship, you'll have to worry about explosive decompression, which can wreck your sensitive salvage or smash you like a bug on a windshield. Making sure to separate out different types of components takes a keen eye and the use of your suit's sensor views if you're trying to get the absolute maximum out of every salvage operation. That's something I wish could be automated to a certain degree, because it's frustrating to be penalized for missing a single light fixture or neglecting to manually detach every last computer console or door control aboard before you toss a chunk of hull into the furnace. And it becomes a chore to then hurl every one of those small pieces into their own receptacle individually. Where shipbreaking gets more complicated is where you're handling the valuable reactor, which is very much like disarming a bomb. While a Type 1 reactor can simply be grabbed and tossed into the receptacle before it goes critical, more advanced versions have an order of operations that must be completed first to maximize the amount of time you have before it goes boom. That sound you heard was my GeForce RTX 3080 crying uncle. This has the same tension as figuring out whether to cut the red wire or the yellow wire on an explosive and mistakenly firing your cutting beam at a fuel line that hasn't been fully flushed yet can instantly vaporize you, sometimes a bit unfairly if you ask me. But pretty much everything is spelled out for you if you know where to look in the tooltips that pop up when you target something, so it never felt obtuse. There are several different classes of ship to dissect, each of which has its own layout, reactor configuration, and peculiarities you must learn to disassemble them efficiently. That's a good initial challenge, but what Shipbreaker desperately needs to keep things interesting is different objectives within that, beyond simply breaking a ship down into its parts. And those rarely pop up. I enjoyed it most when I was given a secondary shopping list of parts to acquire to work on a side project, but there's not nearly enough of that kind of thing. Even when you unlock the remote detonating demolition charges, Nothing really changes because those simply allow you to destroy cut points that are rated too high for your laser, and I didn't encounter more than a handful of those before I unlocked the charges. As time went on in my 35 hour playthrough, I wanted more variety and more pressure, but it never came. Every salvage operation takes place in the same space dock facility, and you're always alone, never at risk from anything but your own carelessness. It isn't until the final mission that the objective is shaken up at all, and that's in the most basic of ways. There's only one iteration of that idea to play with. Considering that it took me 25 ships to complete the story, with each one taking an average of an hour and a half to hack to pieces, frankly that was about twice as many as I'd expected given the amount of content here. 
The fees you incur by moving slowly are meaningless because hard space economy makes no sense. For the entirety of the campaign, you're trying to work your way out from underneath a mountain of debt $1.2 billion high, which means that unless you're keeping careful tabs on your ledger, you might not even notice the dent that a $10 million haul makes on the total. It certainly drives home the story's point about being effectively trapped in this servitude forever. At the same time, when the number is so big it makes decisions like whether to buy equipment repair kits for $9,000 or to wait as long as you can to top off your thruster fuel for $10,000 per charge seem like less than a rounding error. In reality, Hard Space's true currencies are the two types of points you earn for filling in each increment on the salvage bar. One of these lets you improve your tools with mostly dull incremental upgrades like better cooldown speeds, capacities, and durabilities that don't do much to change how you play, while the other rakes you up, which in turn unlocks new upgrades to be purchased and progresses the story. It's oddly camouflaged, though I suppose you could interpret that as a message that money isn't what's really important. But if that's so, what's with the time limits on shifts? Every time you go out into the shipyard, you're given a 15 minute countdown within which you're encouraged to do as much work as possible, and at the end you're booted back to your dormitory. Then you can simply go back to the ship you were working on in the next shift, with the only cost being the monetary fees associated with each outing. That makes the entire concept of getting pulled out for the end of a ship feel as pointless as the money does, and the fact that you already have to return to your base every few minutes to restock oxygen and thruster fuel makes it just another annoying interruption. It should be noted that you can turn off shift timers and oxygen fuel limits in the non-standard modes, and if I were to play through the campaign again, I definitely would. The puzzle-like concept of dismantling hard space shipbreakers, starships, and zero-g is sound, and it's actually very fulfilling and zen-like to learn to do it well. When you're still learning the ropes, extracting a reactor without blowing yourself to hell is a tense kind of slow-paced action. The problem is, outside of its handful of ship types with different layouts and reactor disassembly procedures, that task is almost never evolved or riffed on in any meaningful ways, so it descends into routine labor fairly quickly. At the same time, its use of money may be thematically appropriate for the amusing corporate dystopia setting, but being crushed under such a giant mountain of debt makes several other systems feel like pointless inconveniences rather than decisions about how to spend your resources or a sense of progression. The fact that the story requires so much repetition of the same tasks eventually lets all the air out of it well before completion. For more adventures in space, check out our reviews of Galactic Civilizations 4 and LEGO Star Wars The Skywalker Saga. And for everything else, stick with IGN.